Okay, um, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Chevalier's Books Online. We are the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles. Um, this afternoon, we're hosting Levi Tadar for his new book, By Force Alone. Um, it's a pretty modern, very enlightening retelling of the legend of King Arthur, um, as you have never heard it before, I promise you. Uh, you might also know Levi already from his previous books. Um, he's the award-winning author of Osama, The Violent Century, A Man Lies Dreaming in Central Station. And today with him is Ian McDonald. He's the author of Luna New Moon, Luna Wolf Moon. Uh, we'll be having a Q&A a little after the discussion. So, you know, hold on to all of your burning questions until then. Or uh, if you can't hold on to them, uh, feel free to drop them into the chat room and we'll get to those questions a little later. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and pass the mic on to these two lovely gentlemen, uh, Levi and Ian. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So how long have you been trapped in the Canary Islands by COVID-19 there? <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping my location secret, Ian. It's, uh, <laughs> it's my, my secret Arctic base. Exactly. Um, I have to say I'm very disappointed I did an event with Sylvia Moreno-Garcia uh, last week and Sylvia is clearly much more of a major attraction than you are. Um, oh. So, yeah, you're, you're officially <laughs> off my list of people to... Uh, of course, the, the, the downside of that is that everyone who shows up is a massive Sylvia Moreno-Garcia fan <laughs> rather than has any yeah. slight interest in, in my book. So. They're not there for you. They're not there for you. They're, they're, they were there for her, you know? <laughs> I know, it's like, amazing. You, <laughs> you get one giant bestseller, suddenly. <laughs> I wouldn't know what that feels like, but I assume it's nice. Wouldn't it be nice, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yep. Yeah, um, uh, Olivia and I, we, we kind of saw each other in the in I'm going to say in the flesh. That sounds rather creepy. Uh, possibly the only physical science fiction convention that happened this year. It was about it was last month, was it? Um, in in Avales in Spain. Was it that long ago? Yeah, it was almost two months ago. Was it? Good yeah, God. and luckily we didn't kill anyone, which is you know <laughs> if you think about it, it, was the stupidest thing that anyone. <laughs> could possibly do is organize a science fiction convention in the middle of a global pandemic. And they know that the only people desperate enough to cross international borders are science fiction writers. They're just right, desperate yeah. to get out of the house. Um, but yeah, luckily I mean, we because... didn't kill Ian Watson, which is nice. It amazed me nobody actually, as far as I know, even just positive. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, just to explain that no one wanted this event to take place. Uh, there were incre an incredible amount of undercover police officers yes, throughout okay. this event. I think basically every second science fiction fan was actually a police officer in disguise. <laughs> And then the one time we sat in the bar, I think you missed it, but about eight, like three police vans and, and about 10 policemen stepped out. There were, there were more of them than there were, there were of us. And they kind of, <laughs> we were like, yes, officer, I will go back to the hotel very peacefully. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not going to resist. Um, so yeah. it, was, it was interesting. It was a bit scary. It, it was it was strange. It was, it, was like, it was like a little kind of bubble of bubble of history in the middle of the present. It was it was like a tiny, a, a tiny kind of long weekend of the way things were. Um, but what I mean, I've, I've, I I I wrote a report for Locus about the whole thing. So if 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 it, if it ever sees print, but 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 what was interesting was the Spanish seemed to understand, um, you know, how mask wearing, washing your hands. So you know. Well, maybe not so much social distancing, you know, but there are rules and, and people more or less agree to them, as opposed to in Ireland, where it's like an infringement of your civil liberties to have to think of anybody other than yourself. But, 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 yeah, but it, was, it, was, it, was, it was weird. It was weird. It was, well, well, we should explain that we only ever see each other when we're lucky enough to be invited to some event somewhere, usually to talk about science fiction, which is always weird for me because I never considered myself a science fiction person in particular. 
Um, and and the, the, the funny thing is, when people invite people as science fiction writers, they take them very, very seriously. So you're expected to suddenly become, you know, you have to talk to these very, um, do you remember those little, um, you know, communist cadets, I think they were. There were some sort of the, the future astronauts of China and they were in the front row and they, they listened to everything we said and they asked the, the most important, they asked some serious questions. And I'm like, why are you asking me? I don't know which planet to colonize. Like I could, I could make something up, but um, it's amazing how seriously you've been taken. Um, we yeah. did an artificial intelligence conference in Cambridge. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, and the thing is, we just make this stuff up. You know, that, that's 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 yeah. kind of it. Yeah, yeah. I know. So anyway. I'm going to ask you a book-related question. What what drew you to the matter of Britain? Mostly my hatred of Britain. <laughs> I think is the, um, you know I loathe I loathe Britain in general. I have see I'm not an important writer, so no one's going to be quoting me in the Guardian tomorrow saying, "Oh, he said he loathes Britain." How dare he? Um, you know, um, I actually had to teach this stuff. That was the weird thing. I kind of got dropped into teaching American undergrads, which is a whole different story, which is literally someone said, go and teach them about British fantasy fiction, like a proper literature course. It's not a, like a three, three credit course. They all failed miserably. Uh, so I had to kind of teach the, um, you know, the guy who set up the course was sort of like a medievalist. So he started, he's teaching them stuff like uh, Gawain and the Green Knight in the original Old English and discussing the color coding in the poem. What do the colors signify in Gawain and the Green Knight? I'm like, who the fuck? What the fuck is the Green Knight? Like, I don't know. So I had to start learning about this stuff. And the more I read about it, the more I couldn't... I couldn't wrap, and I had to teach this a few times. <laughs> that was the thing. I kind of taught this course a few times, and um, and I was like, I don't get it. Like, I'm reading this story, and I'm I'm kind of like, everybody's saying it's about chivalry and how great it is, and like, read the freaking story. It's a horrible story. It's violent and rapey and horrible, and you know. And I was like, how come no one's written the story the way it's supposed to be? Everyone's like, oh, THY, T you know, THY. But all the people who write our story and fiction are horrible people. I'm hoping I'm excluding myself from this illustrious list. Yeah. But I mean, THY wasn't, you no, know, you're he liked children person. a little bit too much. Um, yeah. Marion Zimmer Bradley, you don't even want to Google. And Thomas Mallory, the original guy who gave us Le Mort d'Artour, was literally a murderer, a thief. Like, he, he, he died in prison. <laughs> he was such a horrible person. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't understand why everyone is saying this is such a great story about, you know. It's not. It's a, it's a horrible story. So I was like, well, that's, if no one's done it, I Googled it. I was like, did no one, why did no one write it like this? Um, and then I thought, oh, you know, screw it. I'll do it. Like. And it's, I think it's mostly my, my, my great indifference to Britain that allows me to, to take the piss out of it, in a way. Because I've seen it reviewed a couple of times as kind of the Brexit King Arthur. Now, is that something you're happy with? Is that something you're easy with? Or do you want to kick that, um, that one around a bit as well? Is that is that something that yeah. with you? Yeah, very much. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the the irony is, I write a book as you know called "The Man Lies Dreaming," which is about Adolf Hitler as a private detective, um, in in an alternative history England where fascism is slowly on the rise, um, which basically drew attention to the fact that Britain, when I came back in two thousand eleven, late two thousand eleven felt very much sort of like Nazi Germany. Well, not Nazi Germany, but Germany in the 1930s, which is kind of the way you feel about the US as well at the moment, you know, which is kind of, it's Germany 
in the 1930s. It's not as bad as we know it's going to get in 1941, but it's very much on that cusp. And I wrote this book to kind of say, look, this is where we go. I never actually imagined when I wrote the book, it was published in 2014. So it was before Brexit, it was before Trump. And it wasn't supposed to be like, let me tell you how it's going to be. It was kind of me saying, please don't let it be like this. And then, and then it turned out exactly the way, you know, I kind of wrote it. And um, that was a bit frustrating. So I think by force alone, he's again responding to that nationalistic myth building, you know, that the idea of a golden age and the idea of the mm. British um, and, and the English identity. And I didn't know, I mean, I'm really sorry. Like I know, like you're, you're from Ireland. I didn't, I don't know anything about England. You know, I didn't know there was England and Ireland and Wales and what's the other one? Scotland. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Scotland. <laughs> you know, the other one. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't understand any of that stuff. So I had to learn a lot about where these people came yeah. from and the successive waves of immigration that came in. And so it was a lot of fun having Merlin giving incredibly xenophobic, racist speeches. I really enjoy writing horrible people, basically, as I found out. <laughs> you know, there's, there's something inside me that delights yeah. in just being... Once you've written Adolf Hitler, there's just no... There's no coming back from that. It's, it's kind of all downhill from there, isn't it? You kind of start at the top. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I often get criticised for... for but by people on Goodreads, yeah, I, I read my Goodreads. If you said, I, all these people were deeply dislikable, I said, well, I mean, you know, I, mean, I mean, who wants to read about likable people? You want to read about interesting people, but you don't want to read about likable people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a great joy in writing horrible people. That's yeah. kind of the thing. Um, I think what I kind of realised, I can either write these sort of, you know, because otherwise it's like, I wrote The Bookman, you know, that was my first book. And it's, it's about this guy and he kind of gets drawn into this adventure and he's kind of going along with it. <laughs> he's going along with it, you know, he's, he's pretty passive. And I'm like, well, most of us, if someone dragged us off on some horrible adventure, I mean, what are you going to do? He's just going to go, okay. Uh, you're not going to be very active. They call it like an active protagonist. Are you? <laughs> you're not going to be an active protagonist. I can barely get up in the morning let alone save the world. But, but there's something about evil people that makes them, they're very goal-driven. They make good protagonists. They, yeah, it, they really want that ring of power to take over the world, you know? Yeah, it, it's, it's like, I mean, I, mean, I, I do some work in, in the theater and as any actor will tell you, it's always much more fun to be the bad guy. You know, it's always much more fun to write the bad guy as well on the back of the other. Whoever they are, um, uh, the villains are always more entertaining. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I had a profound question there, and, I, and I've so in a sense, you, you've been writing not so much. Uh, um, it's not so much the matter of Britain, but the matter with Britain, really, is it? Um, that, that's the quote I saw. I'm actually calling it the antimatter of Britain. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because what I re well, what happened was, it's not that I realized, it's not that I had an epiphany, but, um, you know, John, who is our, our shared agent, uh, said, yep. you, know, well, you know, you should talk to the uh, publishers, you should talk to the editors, and you should discuss what you're doing next. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing next. Like, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm chatting to both, because I've got an American editor on this book and a, and a British editor on this book. And I'm kind of going, well, you know, like, theoretically, if you've done Arthur, you could then go on and do the rest of the matter of Britain. So you could do Robin Hood. At which point, Tor kind of said, well, we already have a Robin Hood book. <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking, well, you already have like a million of King Arthur books. So I don't really understand the argument. Um, so I think maybe that was it. So I thought, well, you know, you could do this as a quartet of books. You can look at the, the mythology, the, the self-mythologizing of Britain. And the interesting thing is that King Arthur is kind of set in the first migration, which is the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes, which always makes me laugh because it sounds like the Jews. So I love having lines about the Jews coming. The Jutes, I mean, the Jutes are coming <laughs> over here, taking our job, not the Jews. 
Um, and then Robin Hood is essentially set or traditionally set um, after the Norman invasion. So those are the two stages when Britain is settled by, a, by successive waves of, of people. Um, what happens after that, if you, have, if you look at the Elizabethan Golden Age and then the Victorians, it start, that's Britain going and becoming the colonizer you know, starting this whole idea of the, 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 the British Empire, which is yeah. an, an expression coined, as I found out recently, coined by John Dee, the, um, the, the magician slash, what was it, the guy who talked to angels and did black magic and horror stuff. No, uh, Dr. Dee? Dr. Dee. Dr. Dee? Dr. Who? Yeah. Um, he came up with this idea of the British Empire, and he was trying to get the British to to have an empire. And no one in Britain really paid him much attention, as I found out. They kind of like, well, you know. And I'm reading a little bit about it at the moment, because I finished my Robin Hood book. It's a very strange <laughs> Robin Hood book. Very strange. And there's also um, in Ivanhoe. If you read Ivanhoe, there's a there's oh, a yeah. Jewish character in Ivanhoe. There's Rebecca, who's the daughter of Isaac of York. And I'm reading this and I'm researching it. And I'm like, what the fuck were Jews doing in, in, in Nottingham in like 1200? Oh, yeah. Why? Why are we there? Um, and that was, that kind of prompted some of the next book is, is my very Jewish, Jewish Robin Hood. And the main character kind of goes, this isn't my story. I'm Jewish. I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the British with their bullshit sort of stuff. So that was fun to do, but there's a lot of mushrooms. So, so I'm reading a little bit about the Elizabethan, because oh, I think yeah. we talked about it in Spain, right? We did, I'm reading yeah, about we the did, Elizabethans yeah, yeah. going to America, basically. And what happened, what I'm realizing now, and I mean, I'm in an interesting place right now, because I'm where Columbus stopped on the way to the New World. And yep. I'm very much in the crossroads. It's right behind me, down the window. I can, I can the see the sea out your between, window. Yeah, okay. it's very nice. Um, between the new world and uh, the old world. And so the, the Spanish kind of went to South America. They went to the islands and something. And they are robbing the place blind. They are just bringing treasure. They're bringing ships full of gold and precious stones across. The Portuguese kind of had a deal with the Spanish that said, we'll go this way, you go this way. So the Portuguese are going all, of, all over Africa, around Africa to India and China. They are playing the game, you know, like nobody's business. The British are kind of just, just kind of like sitting there going, oh, you know, maybe we should do something, but I don't really know what. And then at some point, apparently someone caught um, uh, and, you know, an Indian chief, as they called him then, or something, and brought him back to the court of Henry VIII. And um, everyone was very excited about it. So you have all these young British upper class, you know, guys, and they're, they're, they're sitting around. They're like, you know, it would be really good if we went to America and caught ourselves an Indian and brought him back to the king. Wouldn't he give us a lot of money for it? Like, literally, that's what they do. They get into a boat. They haven't got a clue how to use the boat or a sailor boat, they go off to America, they somehow make it there, realize they didn't bring any food with them and they don't know how to catch any food. They turn to cannibalism, they start eating each other, right? And literally the captain notices that the crew is disappearing one by one. This should be like a horror film. And, and he, he becomes suspicious and he goes off the ship and he goes off into this wilderness and he runs into one of the crewmates and the crewmate is eating a steak. <laughs> and, and he says, where did you get that steak? And the guy goes, oh, I caught a bear. And he goes, there's no bears around here. And the guy finally breaks down. He's like, okay, okay, I'm eating a buttock. <laughs> I'm eating a buttock. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is a true story. So they're eating each other. And just as they're about, they decide that the only civilized thing to do is to cast lots and start eating each other, so, like, you know, moving. Um, and just as they decide to do that, a friendship shows up to rescue them. So they do the only thing English people could possibly do. They kill the French, take their ship, sail it back home, 
And they think they're going to get into trouble for this. Instead, the king goes, well done, you. Um, you did really well. Don't worry about the cannibalism stuff, and I'll pay the friends for the, for the ship they lost. I mean, you could not make this stuff. Up. How did these people ever become a global empire? It's, That's it. you know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I mean, in a sense, that, in a sense, though, that's kind of that's all uh, kind of laced through um, um, the, the King Arthur book as well. You know, it's 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 the whole thing as we're seeing now is that Britain is a has always been a vaguely incompetent country and never does things very well or with or with or with, or with kind of long term things or very clear design just bumbles through and things happen and get and it gets lucky and I, and I kind of got that sense of the book it was it was it was, it was just this this gang of thugs and incompetence happened to be in the right place at the right time and mythology descended around them. Well, I mean, I I honestly don't know enough about it. And also, I you know, I essentially come from a country that was it was never an official um, colony of the British. I think it was a mandate. It was a, one of those different things. And so, you know, I grew up on the idea of fighting the British. Um, you know, people trained to fight the British, they hit weapons. You know, we would spend every summer, we would go with a metal detector and go looking for the, the weapon cache um, from from the time when people were fighting the British. We never found it. Like, basically, they buried all these guns and ammunition all over Israel to fight the British, and then they forgot where it was. So to this day, they're finding caches of ancient weaponry. Um, lying around, so we'd always you would go looking for them. Um, yeah, I don't it, know, it but it, it makes for an interesting. Hmm? No, I just because it is not so different in Northern Ireland, but we're, we're kind of finding caches from the 19, 1960 and nineteen eighteen gun running and all that that they're still turning up. You know, but folk go, you know, people go to build build a new house and find this weapons dump underneath it. So. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's like armed squirrels hiding their nuts. <laughs> I mean, have you have you never been tempted to write a a British novel? <laughs> I've 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 done a I did kind of three novels about Ireland back in the nineties. Um, one was uh, there was Hearts, Hands, and Voices, Stroke, the Broken Land, depending depending on where you live. Title changes. Which is kind of a kind of sci-fi take on Irish history. Uh, there was King of Morning, Queen of Day, which was kind of a, a, a was supposed to be a Celtic, uh, a Celtic three-part fantasy, except it in one volume, and it's got four parts as well. And then I did um, a book called Sacrifice of Fools, which is basically that rubbish novel, Alien Nation, uh, except I made all the aliens live in Northern Ireland. Uh, so that, um, I love that book, and it cost me my US publisher, so I kind of stopped doing that. <laughs> Though, well, when the time is right around Northern Ireland again, I may go back to it again. Well, what are you actually? Because you've just done uh, just to. Thing you know what I. <laughs> well, just to explain, I think the last volume of Luna came out in paperback just now in the US. There it is. Yep. Yeah. So, yep. what's are you going back to the moon or are you heading further out? Oh, I've um, I've got this kind of no. I'm 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 kind of heading back, back to Earth again, and um, it's it and it's kind of very near future stuff. It kind of starts. That's the London riots, uh, 2011, w w when you return to this island. <laughs> I think it was um, 2011 on basically, uh, basically the night after Amy Winehouse dies and ends about, ends about 2032. But I have a couple of research trips that got absolutely shafted out. It kind of got fucked out the window by, by the pandemic. And I have no idea when I'm going to be able to finish the book. Um, it, gets, it keeps getting pushed back and back and back and back. But um, yeah, I like it. It's, it, it's good. I've, I've been kind of been on the back border for 15 years now, this one, and it's time to get it written. And now I, and now I want to get it written, and now I can't because we, uh, because we live in pandemic time. So yeah, but yeah, um, 
yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of losing kind of faith in space a bit. <laughs> Do you, do you find, because you've made your career really writing books set in different countries and cultures, in, in Rivers of God, India, um, uh, in Brazil, in Turkey, and I always tell this story that I only wrote Central yep. Station because I was fine with you doing India and I was fine with you doing Brazil, but when you went to Turkey, it was too close to home. <laughs> I was like, I better get in there before he does, yeah. but... But you went to the moon instead, <laughs> and uh, I believe that was yeah. that was much more profitable. But do you find that that's changed now? That you can't do it as much, or you, or it doesn't bother you? I'm, you just... I'm, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm doing it differently now. I mean, I mean, I'm still interested in kind of the global view of things. Um, I mean, I mean, I I wrote about India, I wrote about Brazil, I wrote about Turkey, and they've all turned into very nasty little oppressive dictatorships. So a good reason for me to stop is obviously I'm doing it. I am responsible for all this. So for the good of everyone, I you know I have to stop setting novels in other people's <laughs> countries because I summon the bars of fascism. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm still interested. I'm I'm still interested in kind of the. I think science fiction. Well, the kind of it needs needs to look out for look, needs to look out from itself. Um, it, you know, it's if it's a literature of the imagination, it's always pushing at the boundaries of your experience and your life, and kind of asking other questions and stuff. So I'm, I'm still kind of interested in that, but I'm doing it differently now. Um, yep, yeah, I, I mean, now I wouldn't write those novels. Uh, but the, but they seemed right at the time, and I think they still feel right. Yeah. So yeah. So what? So when are you returning to to the to the benighted islands of Britain? Then are you going to stay? Going to stay in the sun for a few months more? No, I'm going to go back in a week. Okay. So basically, what I realised is, well, I, I mean, I told this last time. I'm sure no one's here. Is last summer instead of having a holiday. I spend the whole summer writing a children's book. As, as you know, I, I, I have one children's book that's coming out in the States um, in two weeks, I think. So I have two books coming out in like the space of three weeks. Yep. Um, so I wrote, so I spent all summer last summer writing a children's book, another children's book, and the working title for it was quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> and it went on submission two weeks before the pandemic hit, before the lockdown came down. So, and it, you know, it's hopeless. It's, uh, so I thought, you know what, this summer, uh, screw it, I'm, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to put that effort in. I'm just going to actually have a holiday. Um, but what, as it turns out, having a really long holiday with, you know, reasonably, you know, pandemic-free area and having, well, you know what the gin and tonics are like over here and so on. Um, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I haven't done anything all summer. And so, and I, you know, I'm bored and my mind is irritable. <laughs> And so I need to go back to England. I hope England is just as miserable and everyone is telling me it is. I hope we have a terrible Brexit. I hope the weather is freezing cold. I hope everyone is super miserable and it's going to be dark for like months and months on end. And I'm going to write a great novel. <laughs> I'm going to write oh, so God. much. <laughs> it's going to be fun. It's going to be glorious. Um, yeah. Because I just can't do it. Man. Because... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's. I mean, fantasy and science fiction. Well, science fiction doesn't predict the future. I mean, no one can do that. But I do think in our in our genres that we that we kind of get, we kind of catch which way the wind is blowing. Maybe before other genres do. You know, we we, we seem fairly attuned to zeitgeist. But um, but but our job isn't to predict. It's it's just to you know, put a finger in the wind and say, this is where the storm is coming from. Well, 
the, the other thing is, um, so, you know, as soon as the pandemic sort of came down, um, the Washington, I, I write a book column for the Washington Post with Sylvia Moran Garcia. Um, and so as soon as this happened, the Post said, can you do a column about pandemic books? And the problem oh. with pandemic books is that they are inherently incredibly boring, or at least I, I find them boring. And as it turns out, actually living through a pandemic is incredibly tedious and boring. There is nothing remotely enjoyable about it. So, <laughs> like, what's the point of predicting a pandemic if you still have to write a giant boring book about it? Yeah, you know? it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it, yes, because, yeah, because it's either everyone dies or everyone gets better after over a period of time. I mean, things never happen in, instantly during the pandemic. I, I mean, it's, it's canvas is uh, the plague. But it's not about the plague. That's the thing. I mean, pandemic books are never about the pandemic. I mean, I do fear that we're going to get a whole slew of kind of, of kind of you know, faintly disguised uh, pandemic parables coming away in, in you know in the next few years. And I won't want. I, I don't want to read any of them. I'm not interested. I've lived through it. You know, it wasn't. Well, it was shit. You know. <laughs> But it turns out that people were buying pandemic books. I mean, yeah. once once the pandemic happened, a lot of people bought, uh, what was that old pandemic book that kind of became a bestseller again? It's, um, yeah. and also what uh, I loved is that, I can't remember what it was, but what I love is that everyone is going, this has never happened before. Such a thing has never happened before. It has, it's happened all the time. There's like the, the plague of, yeah. poor, you know, just poor Justinian, right? The plague of Justinian was like they were shutting down ports all over the Roman Empire because there was a plague going on. It had been going on forever. It's just we're not paying any attention to history. Yeah. It's, it's, it, the, the last yeah, one wasn't I mean, even that I long mean, ago. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I mean, I mean, there was Ebola, but hey, that just happened in Africa, so it doesn't really bother us in the West. But it's still a plague, and it was still, it was still the full pandemic lockdown. Uh, you know, it, you know, it just didn't happen to affect any of us, so therefore, it it, it didn't exist. But yeah, well, yeah, and, and, and you're right. You know, it, it's it's. Go on. Oh, oh, then I lost the screen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to Zoom. I'm uh, no. There's an interesting story my brother told me because he was a bush pilot in in Southern Africa for a long time, and he flew for the Red Cross. And he said there was a, at least one instance where he was pretty sure they were they were called to the ground zero of a pandemic. Um, like that, mm. someone who was sick and everyone involved just died. Um, immediately afterwards, and wow. I think I think they didn't pick they didn't pick this person up in the end. They kind of just left that person there, didn't go close. And he reckons that was like a ground zero. And it just makes you realize we might have dodged a few bullets here, like here and there. Um, well, that yeah, it's I mean it's it's exciting. Pandemic means things are going to hell in a hand. <laughs> It was like all the fuss about the Millennium Bug, and it was like, oh, well, you know, the Millennium Bug, you know, the problem with it all. Yeah, there was no problem because people put lots of work in for years before to make sure it wouldn't be a problem. And um, It's like you're saying, I mean, I'm sure that they are catching pandemics all over the place, you know, closing things down before they get. You never hear about the successes, only the failures. I mean, this is what I love about, you know, occasionally when you go to these conventions, like the one we did in Spain, and I think the last time was in Sweden or something, you run into these old programmers, and they learned, you know, their, their specialty is something like Fortran or Algo or some ancient programming system. <laughs> and it turns out that 90% of the banking infrastructure is run on completely obsolete systems. And so you occasionally run into some old boy mm -hmm. who doesn't work, but every now and then he gets a phone call from, from a bank and they said, can you come and fix something? And that's, that's it. That's, that's their job. And they're literally maintaining the, the banking system. Um, 
you know, they were telling me all these horror stories, which again, yeah. is sort of like the pandemic is the things you never hear about. But, you know, it's like a zero that gets changed into a one and literally the whole banking, like a whole country yeah. goes down. So I can't remember what we're actually talking about here. <laughs> Maybe it was shit. Yeah, I, I, I would, I'd imagine you could write your own check in that situation. <laughs> Sure. Could <laughs> put a zero at the end of that, please. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, no, I don't know. What should we talk about? Do we? Shall we? I don't know. Yeah. So what? Okay, so okay. So you said that you. So you said you had four projects on the matters of Britain, and there was King Arthur, Robin Hood, uh, Shakespeare. What's the fourth one? That would have to be the Victorian stuff. Um, which okay. is really oh, aging. Hey. It's, it's aging too close to steampunk at that point by default. Um, yeah. But I'm sure there's a way of making it work. And then people are still going to go, oh, it's just steampunk. But, you know. Mm. Um, but I think those are the interesting sort of theories. I mean, the interesting thing with doing Robin Hood is I had to do a lot more history because with King Arthur, there's not much history there. You know, you're. The, the dark ages you just you can make up a whole bunch of stuff with robin hood it's the normans come in and and i have to learn a whole lot of kind of really boring british history british history is insane they're just fighting each other all the time and the kings are fighting the church and the church is fighting the king and then they're all fighting the muslims for some reason like they decide to go off to the holy land and kill everyone it's like you don't understand why they're doing it um so, okay, so, you know, and I have to kind of, I had to learn this, but it's very boring. So occasionally I would, and, I, and I'm telling the story over like a hundred years of ridiculous things that nobody cares about happening. So occasionally I would sum it up and I'd be like, meanwhile, this happened, this happened, this happened, but no one gives a shit, you know. It's, and this is what, I guess this is, this is what you learn in British schools. I don't know. Um, I've never done British history, so... Yeah, um, not really. Um, now, as I said, I mean, I mean, I, I grew up in Northern Ireland, so we have a fair smattering of Irish history throughout that as well. Um, because really, you can't understand British history unless you understand Irish history as well, because the two islands were basically intertwined colonially for, for 800 years. And that's a long time. Um, I mean, I mean, at the moment, teaching of history seems to be world. It's, it's a standard joke. It's like World War Two and the Tudors. But the thing about history is, is you can't really take one chunk out of it without knowing where that, you know, where the Tudors come from, where the Tudors go to, world, uh, you know, World War Two. Where did that come from? Where did it go to? Uh, whenever we did GCSE O levels, we did 20th century history and we did world history, and it was the best thing I ever learned at school. I learned about Kemal Ataturk and the Turkish Revolution in 1928. I learned about Japanese militarism. I learned about the Russian Revolution. I learned about Salazar, the dictator of Portugal. We did the lot. And uh, so I have, a, and, it, and it went up to basically, I, I, I did in the 70s. I, I did my O level history in the seventies, and the last question on the paper was about was about the end of the Vietnam War. So, it was, so it was that recent, and it gave me a good grounding in, in thinking about history as a process, where it comes from, and where it, and, and what spins off from it. But if you're just looking at the little chunks of it, then you get this kind of you know theme park history, you know, where you go from Tudor world to World War Two world, you know, to 18th century world. You know, it, you know it's a process and it connects. See, that's kind of the interesting thing when you grow up doing um, history in Israel is that history really starts a long time before London is even a, a thing, you know. And so you, it's very hard to take British history seriously because as far as you can tell, it's so recent. It's like modern history. It was only 2,000 years ago. Like, who gives a shit? 2,000 years ago, we don't even have holidays that go back. Like, you know, if it's not at least 3,000, 3,500 years, nobody cares. Um, so it's very strange. It's good, you know, and, and America is interesting because America is, has that new mythology. I mean, I'd love to do an American book. I just don't have, you know, and it's, again, it would be me writing about people I don't really know, a culture I don't know, all of that stuff. But someone should do the matter of America 
um, because it, it's so fascinating. But I think for, for everyone who comes from outside America, it eventually it becomes, it's TV America. It's what we see on TV. It's what we see, you know, in the films. It's, and yeah. I think that's what happens to a lot of writers um, when they want to write science fiction. They want to write science fiction about American characters in New York because that's what they see on the X-Files or the... Okay, that's a that's a very dated reference, although it did get really sure interesting. <laughs> but but you know, it's always about John and Jane in New York, and I'm like, but you've never been to New York, and you don't know anyone called John, even though it's an incredibly, as I found out, it's an incredibly common name in, in English publishing. Yeah. Um, but um, and that's and, you know, and I used to say to people like, why can't you write about people like, why can't you write Israeli science fiction? I was like. Well, what is there to say about it? What you know, there's they, you kind of need to have an outsider's eye to actually recognize the exceptional in what other people find commonplace. Mm, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's um, yeah, uh, that kind of writing about America. I think it's Neil Gaiman calls it America Land, which is like America but isn't America. You know, it's it's kind of the Amer the America you write about. And I had a brilliant, pithy, and insightful comment, and it's gone completely out of my head. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I mean, maybe in a sense, the matter of America is superheroes. Um, it, it's, it's kind of Marvel and DC comics, maybe are, you know, that is the matter of America more than anything else. Well, but as, um, again, my, my argument about superheroes is that they're really, they're written by first generation Jews whose families escaped Europe. And if you look at Superman, Superman is very clearly yeah. someone passing. You know, he's, he's a foreigner, he's a stranger, he's trying to pass for a wasp. And that's why they get given all these incredibly waspy names, or, you know, very Anglo-Saxon name, Peter Parker and uh, uh, Kent, what's his name? Clark Kent? Mark. You know, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And, and I think the tragedy of superheroes, not to be like completely anal about it, but the great tragedy of superheroes is at some point Jews stopped writing them and he, and he started getting written mm. by fanboys who actually just like the capes. And it drives me insane. I'm like, let me, but obviously I did a superhero novel. And as it turns out, basically I'm writing about things I don't like, like King Arthur or superheroes. <laughs> and as it turns out, the people who don't like superheroes or King Arthur aren't going to read your book. And the people who like King Arthur or superheroes are going to hate you for being a dick about something they like. So I need a new strategy. I need to, I didn't know there were so many Arthurian sort of fans who oh. to stuff and, you know. Have you kicked um, the hornet's nest? <laughs> possibly, I don't read the comments, or at least I, I stop reading the comments. But they are very <laughs> passionate about something that I hold in very little regard, basically. <laughs> You know, I got a few messages saying, oh, I could teach you some things. I'm like, I honestly don't actually care, though. That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> I honestly, I couldn't care less. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, but yeah, buy the part, book, buy the book. And it's also the fact that you said you've been, you wrote that book, is it four or five years ago? So you've really forgotten what happens in it, you know? And it's, you, you want to do something else now as well. It's, 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 it's past history. Yeah, old books are old books. It, yeah. What do you do? You get messages from people saying, you know, there's a typo on page fifty-five. I got a letter from. Uh, there was an airmail letter, and this, this this was a long way back about King and Morning Queen of Day, from a British expat living in Crete, um, who said very much enjoyed this book, uh, etc. Et but by the way, a glaring error. That particular model of Ferguson tractor that you portrayed in 1938 was not available until 1941. You know, the one with the triple with the triple hitch at the back. And I kind of treasure that kind of pedantry as if it should, should be encouraged. What did happen to me once was uh, Utopial in, in Nantes in France, big, big French festival. And King of Morning, Queen of Day had just come out in French. And... Um, uh, I, I just arrived, was in late, went straight into this panel to talk about the book. Now, I wrote the book, I wrote the book in 1990, and this came out in 2004. And I kind of got whizzed into doing a panel, and a guy asked me, so what exactly is the significance of the conclusion of King of Morning, Queen of Day? And I just blanked, because I could not remember what happened in the story at all. You saw the look of panic 
in my face <laughs> as the audience could. And he threw me a couple of lines and I burbled some kind of Jungian nonsense out of my kind of. But I, I, I'd completely forgotten everything that happened in that book. So it was years ago. You know, when you finish a book, you move on, you're doing something else. The, the only time I was at Utopial was about 20 years ago. I was a kid with dreadlocks. It's another, not, not a fact I like to bring up very often. Um, your... And Terry Pratchett, it was, Terry Pratchett was there. It was like me and Terry Pratchett. Now a whole bunch of other people. And some, one of the organizers came up to me and he said, are you Terry Pratchett? <laughs> <laughs> with dreadlocks, yes. And, um, and I ran into Terry um, by, the, the, by the stairs about half an hour later. And I said, I said something like someone thought I was you, which is really stretching credibility to the limit. And he kind of looked at me and he said, yes, that, that insults both of us in the same sentence. <laughs> um, so, which is my fondest yeah. memory oh, of it. At least I got, I got mistaken and insulted by Terry Pratchett at the same well time. Yeah. You know. I know, so, um, <laughs> was a lovely guy. But um, yeah, we should... Uh, Answer questions? I don't know. Other questions? Oh. Yeah, let's, um, let's get to the audience with some questions. Um, so there's a couple ways that you can ask a question, everyone. Um, if you see the little Zoom feature, you can like, raise your hand, and I'll basically unmute you. Um, however, you can also just cautiously and respectfully unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, or if you would like you could also drop them in the comments instead um but if you see one from aditya uh sorry if i butchered that name um who asked and any interesting or weird things that came up in your research no yeah uh, uh, yep yep um <laughs> yeah um I got one, when I was doing the preliminary research for the Dervish House, I stumbled across the Mellified Man, which is um, a kind of, um, kind of old Arabian, kind of semi-myth semi of, but basically, uh, if, if you've read the book, you'll, you'll know what it's about. If you don't, it, it, it's, it's, it's basically a very old, venerable Arab gentleman when they felt that, they felt that their life had nothing at, at had nothing left to offer would, would try and do one useful thing and um, whenever and they would eat honey for several weeks nothing but honey till eventually they died of massive sugar poisoning and the body would then be preserved in honey and sealed in a lead line a lead line lead sealed stone coffin with a decant made about 100 years in the future and um, they would then open the coffin and you, you would basically have like human 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 conserve inside it's basically um uh, a bit of a sugarized person, but the flesh of a mellified man was considered very, very powerful healing. And if you if if you put it on a on a part of the body, it would cure that. If you ate it, it would cure all your ills. And I kind of stumbled across this and thought, if you're going to find one anywhere in the 21st century, it'll turn up in Istanbul. And I shoehorned it into the book because I bloody wanted to get it in there because it was such a great idea. And um, it's actually it turned out to be the best bit in the book. So. But yeah, uh, yeah, good stuff turns up all the time. I mean, I, I think basically all my books are based just based on the weird things that you find in research, um, which is kind of like, uh, it's what Tim Powers basically does, because what, mm. he, he, what he does is he looks at a period and he kind of apparently has big wall charts with the dates and everything, and he kind of reads everything about it. And he looks for all the weird facts, like the fact that um, Percy Shelley's heart was taken out of his chest and burned or something. I think that, that, was, a, that was a thing that happened. Um, and he looks at all these really weird random things and he says, why did they really happen? Like, what was the real, you know, um, supernatural reason? Because they mm -hmm. wouldn't do <laughs> dumb stuff like this unless there was like a real secret reason behind it, which is what makes him such a great, you know, secret histories writer. Yeah, so yeah. I think for me, pretty much it's, it's, it's all weird facts. It's like 
what, the, the research I do a lot is like into food, like what do people eat and that sort of stuff. Um, I got really obsessed with bread. I did the Singapore Writers Festival a, a while back when I was writing the King Arthur book. And they give you like, they give you someone to help you, I guess. And I got this uh, MA student who was writing a dissertation on, on Roman bread. And I, could, I didn't get to use any of it, but she sent me a dissertation. I just loved it. I was like Roman bread. And they ate sourdough bread, you know, which is what everyone in Britain apparently eats now that there's a lockdown. They all make their own sourdough bread. Um, so, so it wasn't, it wasn't remotely interesting. I just got excited about this idea that I know exactly what, you know, what sort of bread did the Romans eat? I mean, you look up stuff like, um, you know, Roman scrolls apparently were sold by the quality of the paper. So you could buy grade four, grade three, and it's fun chucking these things in. Um, and I, there was one moment in By Force Alone, I think, when I have Guinevere and her gang sort of crossing the, is it the Mersey? What's the one, what's the one in Newcastle? What's the river in Newcastle? Time. The river time. time. The time. And, and up to the point, you know, up to the point that they get to the river, it's very historically accurate. And I'm really working hard to try and figure out what, um, what Celtic cultures and, and, and Angles and Saxons in the sixth century were doing. And as soon as they crossed the river, I was like, fuck this, you know, let's just put some fog around everything and let's have a dragon because it's a fantasy novel. I can do that. I can just, let's have mutants. <laughs> kind of mutants wandering through the fog. It's stupid, it's incredibly stupid. And I think that's what people don't really get. It's all stupid. Um, mm. So, we're, you know, don't take exception to it. Well, what gets me, the only thing that really hurts me is when people don't think something is funny, you know, because the whole, I will go to an extreme length for the sake of a joke that no one is ever going to get, but, but it's, it's just that it's inherently silly. It's just silly stuff, and that's kind of the fun thing about it. Um, the time, oh, we do have yeah, here. Yeah, I, I, yeah, okay. Next question. Yeah. Okay, um, so this one is from Chris. It says, why do you think Arthur is so important to British mythology when he's not actually what we call heroic today? I suppose that's me, actually, isn't it, Ian? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the interesting thing was, as I'm as I'm writing this or whatever, my my old my old history professor, he, he's probably object to me calling him my old history professor because he's probably only a few years older than me. And as I realised later on, he was probably like a kid when he was teaching me, basically. But he's very interested in fascism. Uh, it's originally Italian as well, and they, they know a little bit about fascism. Um, and he's sending me all these links to like white uh, white supremacy groups in the UK who are building on um, Arthurian mythology. So like the white, I think they're called the White Knights of Pendragon. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah which is yeah. basically it's a, it's a, it's a bloke in a flat with bad teeth and a and a and a. Uh, uh, and a heater behind him that doesn't work, you know. It's, it's like the saddest thing you could possibly watch. But it's interesting that they latch on to this stuff. And the reason Arthurian fiction came back into fashion, it only came back into fashion in the 19th century. And Adam Roberts has some very interesting um, stuff that he's written about it. It's basically to contribute to the great British imperial project. That's why they mm. brought it back. That's why Tennyson kind of brought it back, um, is to create this mythology of, of an age. What I don't really understand is that if you read the story, it doesn't make any sense as, as an ideological thing. I mean, Arthur dies at the end, he doesn't even make it, and the people who do take over are the people who Writing the now, writing Robin Hood was interesting because I'm reading a lot about land in England, and land in England is not owned by people in England. It's owned by very, very few people. And there's a very interesting quote that I kind of stuck in. I, I tend to write historical afterwards for my books, basically to bulk up the the word count. 
that's where it started from. I, I would write short books and then I would add a historical afterwards and make it a bit longer. But I got into the habit of doing it. And um, there's an interview with this guy, with this lord, you know, who owns Bastrian. And they said to him, what's your advice to someone? If you want to succeed in England, what's the best way to do it? And he said, well, the best way to do it is if you had a relative who was close friends with William the Conqueror. You know, because they own all the land. Um, I, think, I think people own like 5% of the land in England. Everything else is owned by the crown, various royal families, various landowning families. 17% by corporations, and then there's like a whopping percentage that no one knows who it belongs to, like missing ownership that no one even knows. So uh, that was kind of a shocking, a shocking finding in research. I, I didn't realize how much that Norman conquest still shapes Britain to this day. That, I don't know why you guys never had, well, not you, in, but like the, uh, why there was no, never we, like a revolution we, like in France or, or somewhere else. It, what's amazing about England is that they somehow avoided that, that socialist revolution. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting what you say about Arthur, I mean, he dies at the end. I mean, that is, that's kind of a very British hero because, because, the British don't really do heroes. They're suspicious of heroism. Um, they like kind of adequate failure or thing, you know, or things to end badly because because there's a kind of sense of kind of deep suspicion of of, of, of you know of of the tall poppy. You know, if if you get your head above the barricade, you'll get shot. You know, just be like the rest of us now. Don't show off. Uh, you know. The hero will always meet the bad end, you know, that's what you get for being heroic, you know, why couldn't you be like that, you know, like that, that nice peasant Grimes in the cottage next door, you know, he, he was never destined to be, you know, the ploughboy who becomes the prince, he was just happy to live there and he had a good life, he didn't end up, end up his head in the pool. And, 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 it, and, it's, it, and it's that kind of suspicion of, of competence <laughs> or heroics in kind of any shape or form. Um, I, I kind of find that in, in some ways kind of rather encouraging actually but you're absolutely right about you know about about the middle ages being you know, about the middle ages and kind of chivalry being being recast as kind of as as a national mythology the, the, the whole thing being for, forced together into a kind of a, an imperial narrative yeah that's very interesting <clears throat> shall we do one more if we have how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're about to come up on the end of the hour. Um, we could probably do one more question if someone um, has one. Any volunteers? Any volunteers? No, no one. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually did have a question, though, um, Levi, when I was looking into your, your previous work. And it does seem that, like, you mentioned a little earlier that you don't really in identify as a sci-fi author. Um, I'm curious about if there is a box you would put yourself in because it seems like you've ventured into like pulp fiction a bit um, as well as like many other genres. I'm curious about as an author, how do you cast yourself? Well, I like to take myself very seriously, um, you know, or be up my own ass, basically, uh, and consider myself a very important literary novelist. <laughs> Clearly, the world doesn't see me in that light. Um, no, I mean, I think my heart belongs to science fiction. It's just that the books I write are not really science fiction. I've written one science fiction book, which is Central Station, uh, which is basically a science fiction book where nothing happens. You know, and I kind of basically said, and then, and then a lot of people kind of go, yeah, I read this book, but it's like nothing happens. It's rubbish. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> like nothing happens. Um, you know, which is kind of the antithesis of science fiction. that should be plot driven and have action and <laughs> adventure and saving the world. And I'm like, ah, you know, let's, let's make it about, you know, four weddings and, and a funeral <laughs> essentially. Marriages and funerals and bar mitzvahs. Um, 
So that's why when I do get invited to a science fiction event, it's kind of interesting because you suddenly have to be a science fiction writer. And I get to do the various different things, which is quite nice. So I get to occasionally be a crime writer, you know, go to a crime writer thing. And I get to do a literary festival occasionally be, and be more literary. And then, yeah, it's kind, of strange, it's kind of strange. But I do, I think the science fiction ones are fun because they're a lot more... Ernest, and you get to talk about colonizing Titan, um, you know, and stuff like that. It's very intense and talk to future astronauts. Um, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to go to NASA one day and, uh, if they ever open up everything. But yeah, I don't know. I don't really see myself as anything. Oh, and I get to do comics as well because I've got my comics that's coming out. I get to be a children's author, which I'm very uncomfortable with, I have to admit. And the last time, when my children's book came out and I got dragged into doing a signing for children, it turns out I don't actually like children very much. Like they're nice, don't get me wrong, but I just don't want to talk to them. Um, and they made me go to this event in Milton Keynes, which is sort of like, I don't know what the American equivalent of Milton Keynes would be, but hell, <laughs> it's probably a, a good description. And I went to Milton Keynes to do an event for children and they were very sweet. And at the same event, I had two guys show up and they kind of crept up to me from the side and they said, could you sign this? And I had a copy of a book I wrote, which only exists in a 200 copy edition in hardcover. It's called Lust of the Swastika and it's Nazi steampunk pornography. <laughs> and they had to show up to my one kid signing to say, could you sign this unashamedly horrible book? <laughs> And I was like, yes, just let's do it maybe in a separate room. So that's, that's kind of my audience. It's, uh, yeah, the Nazi porn people and the sci-fi people. And, and occasionally Sting, apparently, but that's and my mum. Although my mum, to be honest, I, she always says, I've, I've started reading your book. Yeah. And that's where the conversation ends forever, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, I, um, I, yep. Uh, my mother insists I give her a copy of every book I've ever written, but she's never read it, any of them, uh, because because the psychology of this, um, she's fairly certain she wouldn't like them, and she'd be too honest to, uh, to lie to me and say she did. So, so, so she just so she just never reads them instead. She, she could not tell a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's yeah. best. Yeah, because yeah, I don't understand all these writers that say, "Oh, my first reader is like my mother," and you know, and it's like, why, what? Leave these poor people alone. Do you want to be a writer who writes books your mother could read? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. The funny thing is, you know, my mom. My mom was born in a refugee camp after the after the war. Um, you know, and um, and a man lies dreaming is basically Adolf Hitler as a private eye, and it's horrible. My mum thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I've, I've never been so pleased. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wrote a funny Holocaust novel that made an actual, <laughs> you know, Holocaust survivor love, so. <laughs> I can retire on that one. Okay, yeah. um, if no one else wants to ask a question, I think um, we're good. Um, Lavi and Ian, thank you so much for your time in this very hilarious hour um, that brought a lot of laughter to me at least. Um, uh, everyone, I also dropped a link uh, in the chat box to make sure you can buy a copy of Five Force Alone online and support Shivali's book. Um, and if you happen to miss anything, um, it'll be on YouTube. Of course, the internet never forgets. Um, so all of our mistakes will be on here forever. <laughs> um, so thank you again, Ian Levy. I hope you get a good night's rest. And um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Right. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Thank you.